Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Adrian. Thank you so much for joining me today. So today we have a very special video. Uh, EU4 has released a development diary. Uh, I believe it was Johan. Yes, it was Johan. He released a development diary today, the 13th of December, 2016. And um, basically, the entire community was hyped for this because he claimed it was probably the largest change to Europa Universalis 4 since the game's release, which was uh, over three years ago now, if I'm if I remember correctly, I believe it came out September 2013. It's uh, it's December 2016 now. This this dev diary, I should remind you guys, I'll actually have a link to this in the description below, just in case you want to see it for yourself if you haven't already. This dev diary uh, has gotten a whopping 420,000 views. I didn't even know that there were that many people that played. Europe Universalis 4. The community is actually fairly small compared to other AAA titles. Obviously, Paradox Interactive is independent, but 420,000 people, almost half a million people have looked at this forum in the last 12 hours. It, it was released today at 4.04 a.m. my time, Pacific Standard Time. I guess it's, it's different their time. And it's, it's literally 4.26 in the afternoon right now. 12 hours, over half a million people have looked at this dev diary. So I wanted to go over what this dev diary was and just kind of talk about it. Maybe you guys can tell me what you think about the dev diary, some of the changes. Um, so basically, they, they've introduced a system called what they call the Ages of Europa Universalis. And so now the game is divided into what Johan describes as four separate ages, which is the Age of Discovery, which is 1400 to 1530, the Age of Reformation, which is 1530 to 1620, the Age of Absolutism, which is 1620 to 1710, and the Age of Revolutions, 1710 to 1821. So most of this I actually do agree with. The Age of Discovery is maybe a little weird because the Age of Reformation, the Age of Discovery, the difference between those two is um, kind of kind of difficult to, to, I guess, balance out or kind of find. Um, you know, obviously the Age of Discovery relates to the uh, expansion of new trade routes into Africa and Asia and, and the discovery of the new world in 1492 and especially during the 1480s, Portugal making, making their way down to almost the Cape of Good Hope actually in Africa. Um, the Renaissance, it's interesting they don't have anything in here about the Renaissance. Um, the Renaissance was said to have kicked off the Age of Reformation, right? The Protestant Reformation happened in 1517 with Martin Luther and the Renaissance itself is actually usually said to have come to an end at, in 1527 um, after the sack of Rome by uh, Imperial German troops from the Holy Roman Empire. And so um, I think the breakdowns, the Age of Discovery, Reformation, Absolutism, and Revolutions are actually pretty, they're pretty good. They're, they're, uh, they're I guess, I guess I would say spot on. Um, I, I would say they're, they're pretty accurate. Um, I would say maybe the only one that's probably a little out of touch would maybe be this age of absolutism. Um, I know that there was, you know, the Dutch Republic and the Netherlands, uh, there, them and, and the eighty years war had, had come to a close. Um, and I know that definitely in England, right? We had the, the English revolution, the war of the three kingdoms between, uh, you know, the King and parliament. Um, and especially Henry V as well, from I believe the 1650s to the 1710s, 1720s. Henry the, um, or not Henry V, um, Louis the Fourteenth in France, right? Louis the Fourteenth. When you think of absolute monarchy, you think of Louis the Fourteenth, right? Or maybe, um, um, yeah, actually Louis the Fourteenth is is probably the best representation of absolutism in in you know uh, this time period, 1620 to 1710. So I think that's also pretty spot on. And then the Age of Revolutions from 1710 to 1821. Definitely 1710 might be a little early. Um, but I can see why they picked 1710. Uh, you know, you have, especially in, in 1776, the American Revolution. 1789, you had the French Revolution. You know, 1821 is when Napoleon Bonaparte had died in exile. So I, I think this, these ages are pretty interesting. They're pretty cool. So it's nice that um, there's there's a dividing up of history in relation to European Universalis 4. However, I think also some people might be a little um, dismayed that there is a divvying up of history at all. Um, I think one of the, one of the nice things about European Universalis 4 was depending on how you played your cards, right? You know, you could always treat history wrong, right? You can always prove history wrong and be able to modernize or have a revolution earlier than, than other revolutions occurred or, you know, be, become an absolute monarchy earlier than historically happened. But you know, that's just me. Okay. So basically a breakdown of these, uh, these new ages is each age has seven objectives that can be fulfilled. And if they are fulfilled, you gain plus three power projection as well as three splendor each month. 
And you may ask what, you know, what is Splendor? Well, Splendor is, according to Johan, the age specific currency you use to purchase abilities. There's seven abilities in each age that each country can purchase. And there's also four unique abilities in each age where countries that historically were powerful in that age can unlock a special ability. So once you achieve these objectives, you gain this Splendor and there are certain abilities in each age that any country can get. But then there's also four unique abilities that are specific to a I guess, particular historical country. So if we actually check this out here, um, here in the age of discovery, we have a lot of stuff that has to do with trade. We have a lot of stuff that has to do with buildings. Um, Denmark is particularly um, influenced here. He's actually playing in this screenshot here. Johan is playing Denmark and he has, he has three unions. And so obviously the Kalmar union is what he's talking about, right? So he's, he's talking about um, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark being ruled by the same ruler, which is three thrones, hold three thrones, which I guess is, is an objective, and you get splendor for that in your age, in your age of discovery. Um, let's see here. Whenever a new age arrives, your power projection from objectives starts decaying, and you can lose all your abilities you purchased in the previous age. So that's pretty curious here. Um, I guess there's this dialogue here that, that can come up. The age of discovery is the current age that Denmark is in, in 1444. Um, he's got four splendor from what it looks like. Base value plus one, fulfilled objectives plus three. Um, and then if we actually, we can actually blow up this image a little bit. If we look particularly at uh, some of these objectives here, control centers of trade, own control or core, at least five provinces with the center of trade. That actually seems kind of high to me, but I guess that's one of the objectives of, an age, of the age of discovery. Maybe for colonial powers, this might actually be fairly easy to achieve. Um, as a nation with a capital in Europe, Asia or Africa, discover at least one province in either North or South America. So discover the new world. That is also uh, something that you can do in the age of discovery. It gets you plender, uh, splendor. And apparently, if, if you look here, there's, you know, these abilities here. Um, this looks like Liberty Desire. That's specific to Denmark from what I'm assuming from the flag here. We have uh, some siege ability here that's specific to the Ottomans because the Ottomans were some of the first um, nation, one of the first nations in Europe to use uh, cannons effectively as far as, you know, combat, but also with sieges, right? They, they came up with cannons and the Great Bombards a lot earlier than other people did. They also equipped um, arquebuses and muskets to their troops much earlier than most mainstream European armies did. Um, they didn't get around to that until about the 1500s or so. Whereas the Ottomans, it makes sense that they have this ability here, this siege ability, uh, because they did it earlier than anybody else. Um, and then apparently there are rules. There are certain rules that are uh, that happen in these ages here. So, uh, like, so some rules of the age of discovery or that religious rules are valid previously before 1650. So I believe that has to do with uh, crusades and uh, the Protestant... I, I think it's the... Um, the 30 years war. So crusades, 30 years war. I, I think even maybe even holy wars also actually expire after 1650. Now they're actually tied to ages. There's only certain ages that you can use those, um, those features in. So that's pretty cool. And then apparently the peasants war, the Castilian civil war, the war of the roses, uh, those are disasters that can occur to certain countries. They can actually only happen in the age of discovery. So after that certain time point, you actually don't have to worry about those disasters anymore. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> um, in this dev diary, he gives a breakdown of some of these objectives that you can you can take or that you have to uh, try to achieve in the Age of Discovery, and um, and then some abilities actually that you can purchase that you can actually buy during the Age of Discovery. Some of them, one of them is allow an edict feudal de jure law, um, transfer vassal war goal. This one's pretty interesting. I'm not entirely sure what that is, but that sounds really powerful. Transfer vassal war goal. It sounds as though, yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, create a claim bordering claims. I don't really know what that means. Um, I guess that's an ability that you can purchase 50% longer lasting claims. If you can buy that in the age of discovery, that's very powerful. 50% longer lasting claims. So instead of 25 years, claims would last, I guess, 22.5 years. All right. If I did my math right here, 20, 25 years. No, I think it's 37.5 years. Yeah. Half of 25 is about 12.5. Yeah. 37.5 years. That's how long claims would last. If you have this ability here. 50% uh, longer lasting claims. Explorers and conquistadors do not cost maintenance while on missions. I'm not sure what that means. I think when they say maintenance, they mean your ship fleet or your land army doesn't cost maintenance when you're doing something. So that's kind of interesting. Or that has something to do with another feature they're going to add a little later. Um, here's another ability. Finish qualities get plus one random development. That's very powerful. Very powerful ability if you were able to get this for especially colonial powers like Portugal and Spain. You could easily build massively more powerful empires than you already have with a plus one random development for every finished colony. That's, that's crazy, 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 crazy. 
Let's see here. Gain plus one attack bonus in your capital's terrain type. That's also very curious. That's that's a, uh, an ability that you can buy. So say you have a capital on grasslands and you fight in some place that's usually only grasslands. You actually get a plus one attack bonus um, in your capital's terrain type. So that, that could be very powerful, you know, uh, for step hordes, things like that. Maybe Russia, um, who battles on the steps a lot. Could be curious. Um, these are these are some of the special historical nation abilities, right? These are these are unique and particular abilities to nations during those um, those ages. During the Age of Discovery, the Ottomans can get a 33% siege ability. Portugal can get plus 50 colonial growth. That's freaking stupid high. Holy crap. Uh, Denmark can get um, plus or 30 less liberty desire in their subjects. So if Norway or Sweden become rebellious, at least during the Age of Discovery, Denmark can actually make them a lot less rebellious. And then Venice here can actually get plus 50 trade power from ships um, during the Age of Discovery, right? So Venice was very powerful during the Age of Discovery. 50% trade power from ships. That's crazy high. That's really, really high. So... Some pretty interesting things. Um, <clears throat> there's also uh, something that they actually looks to have inspired, looks to have been inspired from the Civilization um, franchise, is that there's something called a Golden Era. Um, a Golden Era can be started once per game for a country, and as soon as you fulfill three objectives in an age, it lasts for 50 years. So once you have three objectives in an age, you can start a Golden Era, a Golden Age of prosperity and you know military superiority and technological advancement and economic growth. And uh, that'll last for 50 years. You get one of those per game if you're able to achieve up to three objectives in an age. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I guess the Golden Age also gives you 10% cheaper costs for anything you spend Monarch points on. That amounts from coring to technology, I'm guessing, to ideas. That's freaking crazy high. That is like ridiculous. That is that is thousands of Monarch points in the course of 50 years. That could be thousands. Hundreds for sure, but thousands is crazy um increases your land and naval morale increase by 10 percent. that's also that's pretty decent whoopsies that's also pretty decent and um <clears throat> let's see what else does it change and uh, you produce 10 percent more goods um depending on the good that could be good or bad i mean if you produce slaves ivory gold um let's see what else spices uh i believe silk slash cloth i think it's cloth um i also think naval supplies is actually pretty uh pretty um i guess expensive or valuable in the age of discovery as well uh copper and iron as well 10 percent more goods could be could be huge right that's like not, it's not just production efficiency it actually could be much more so that's pretty cool it's actually 234 likes on this post 79 have actually respectfully disagreed and then 27 have voted helpful so um i want to know what you guys think about this what do you what do you think about these new features i am excited Excuse me. Um, I'm very excited actually for these new features, but I will admit this wasn't the change that I was really expecting from Europa Universalis 4 for this new dev development diary. I don't even know if this change was even needed per se. Um, I thought they were going to change the trade system. The trade system has been the same since the game has released with the trade nodes, the trade power, privateering, things like that. And a lot of people actually have a lot of gripes with the trade system. They think it's convoluted. They think it's unclear. They think that it could be changed a little bit and made a little more simpler. Um, a little more intuitive and, and possibly, you know, better quality as far as the trade system with, with actual trade goods that um, are produced and can be modified by market economics and things like that. I guess taking some, some cards from Victoria too. But this new this new system, this age of European Universalis 4, I guess, this age system, I, I guess just, we can just call it the age system, um, was definitely not something that I was expecting. And um, like I said, I'm excited about it, but I also do have some reservations about it. I'm actually kind of worried about how the community is going to respond to this. I'm assuming this is going to be locked behind some sort of DLC um, or at, at least some sort of patch. And, and I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried about what direction the game is going to go in from here. Um, you know, give me your thoughts. Give me your thoughts on whether you are excited or if you don't like this. Some people have brought up that this, this adds a bit of railroading to the game. This actually railroads the game to go in a certain way for certain countries and certain players. Um, especially after some time has gone by with the age of discoveries, the age of reformation, age of absolutism, um, people have commented that there might be a little less of a dynamic feeling. Things are going to start to end up the same all the time. Um, you know, different by different means, you'll have the same outcomes, right? France is still going to be powerful. The Ottomans are still going to be powerful. Maybe, you know, England and Portugal and Spain are going to be the, the historical colonizers and then dominators of the world. 
Um, some people have said that this railroads the game even more, right? It's not actually adding any sort of dynamism to the game. It's not adding any sort of dynamic um, paths for you to take. It's actually, you know, shortening the paths and cutting them out and blocking them and, and actually making uh, the AI be a lot more railroaded than they were before. I don't know how valid those complaints are because we haven't had any hands-on gameplay with this system. Uh, we haven't tested anything. So who knows? Who knows? Let me know what you think about the comments below. Uh, I want I want to hear your thoughts on what you think about this development diary. So, all right, guys, I will see you uh, in the next episode or the next video. Thank you so much for watching as always, and uh, let me know what you think about this new development diary and what your thoughts are on this new this new system of ages of Europe Universalis. So, all right, guys, I'll see you soon.